Okay, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to a joint meeting between House Healthcare and House Human Services today. Um, we're going to be taking up the topic of um, what the hospitals refer to as boarding uh, and um, looking at sort of the, the exit uh, to lower levels of care and what are some of the barriers and uh, I hope that we get to what some of the solutions are as well. So um, I want to apologize at the outset. I um, have to go to a conference committee uh, meeting on the budget adjustment. So I'll be leaving right around 930. Um, but you'll be in the capable hands of uh, Chair Houghton and Vice Chair Brumstead from my committee. So um, thank you. Thank you and welcome all. And I hate having our backs to I know. Uh, witnesses <laughs> and uh, but um, we would love to see Dr. Leffler um, join us at the All the, the way table. down All there. The <laughs> the table. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's settled. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. And I did mention to witnesses if they, if they have something they're going to share that they need to join the Zoom room yes. before they get to the head of the mm -hmm. table. <laughs> I'm sure. Great. And that's <laughs> all good. My name is Dr. Steve Leffler. I'm an emergency physician by training. I've been an ER doc for more than 30 years at the University of Vermont Medical Center. For the last five years, I've been the president and chief operating officer of the medical center. I'm here to talk today about the boarding crisis in the hospitals across the state. I'm gonna talk about one, one component of that, which is patients that are staying longer than they should in the hospital because they can't get to the next level of care. So the first thing I wanna do is I do wanna acknowledge and thank AHS. They've been a good partner on this. We've worked very hard with them for solutions. Um, you should know that um, since the pandemic, we've lost about 500 nursing home beds in the state of Vermont. Um, and prior to that, I would argue that it wasn't perfect prior to the pandemic, but it's made it infinitely more difficult to discharge patients. Um, I always like to start with the state of where we're at right now. So at the University of Vermont Medical Center this morning, had eight patients boarding in our ED, waiting to go upstairs. We had 68 patients that were ready for discharge, did not need to be at the academic medical center, but didn't have a place to go. Of those 68, 28 were people who needed what I consider to be regular nursing home care, to go if there was a bed ready for them. And 40 are what we call long stay or custodial. Um, they're going to be with us for a long time. They are difficult to transfer out because they either have complex healthcare needs, they might have a behavioral health need, they might have dementia, they don't have a good payer, they might be on a very expensive medication. So those 40 patients can stay months to over a year. We discharged one over the summer that had been with us for more than a year. Um, this problem impacts every hospital in the state of Vermont. Vermont is so small and our hospitals are small and don't have much excess capacity, that a border in an inpatient bed at the medical center can literally impact St. Johnsbury this morning. So right now, this morning, we have five patients across the state waiting for transfer to the medical center. That's never good. It's the first thing I, as a doctor, I look at every day. Who's waiting to get down to us that can't come right now? Because those are people that we've identified and the other hospitals that are identified need to come, and we're trying to make room for them. So a long-term border on one of our medical floors may not seem like a big deal. We have 430 beds, but if every bed is full, we already have ED borders, where's that patient gonna go? And so we try to do our best to help manage, have St. Johnsbury manage that, that can have an impact on them. They might have to have an extra nurse be with that patient or change what they're doing today. Um, so this problem impacts every part of the system. I also wanna say that it's hard to fix only one piece because Vermonters need to have a continuum of needs. So any one person may need to start in St. Johnsbury, be transferred to us for an academic tertiary care problem. We need to do our part of that job. And then we need to get them back either maybe to a nursing home, maybe to assisted living, maybe back to their home where the local DNA can care for them and get them better. So all parts of the system have to function. There's really not a lot of excess capacity in Vermont right now to manage us if we were in Boston and one of the hospitals went on diversion, they manage that all the time. We mustn't go someplace else, but we really have no mechanism because we are the place for 
people who need the most high acute needs. And we're proud of that, by the way. We want to be that place. And we want to accept everybody and then if they need to come. We need to have the capacity to do that. Um, I will, our ask is actually not anything for the Academic Medical Center today. I'm not here advocating for UVM Medical Center or the work. My ask is to basically make investments into the continuum of care, make investments so we have more nursing home capacity, more beds for patients with high acute needs, and more bed, more opportunity for people to get care in their home when they need it. Um, if those 28 patients today can go out of the day sooner, that makes a giant difference to who can be transferred to us. If those 40, 40 patients who are, can get the care needs they met, need met, not in the hospital, that will open up a lot of capacity to get people to the right place. So, thank you. A couple. All right, we're going to alternate. So, Lisa and then Dan and then Jubilee and then Art. So, I'm thinking obviously of cost of care. Um, uh, is UVM being paid for these 28 or are they sort of? I, mean, I know Medicare will sort of pay for a course of care, and if a person needs to be discharged, they they sort of stop paying. Or what what's the payment? So what's happening with that? When patients come to the medical center for medic from all the payers, um, we get paid a set amount of money for how long it looks like they need to be there. So for if it's <laughs> one of these patients, long stay patients came in with um, pneumonia, and we would get paid for five days. But now they've been there for 95 days or 105 days. We get no more money from Medicare for that. Thank you for your testimony. And thanks for um, talking about this issue because uh, it's something we need to really address. I was just wondering, you said you had been practicing medicine for 30 years. Have you seen anything like this before? No, not exactly. So um, across the country right now, Hospitals, many hospitals, I want to be honest, in, in many states are facing this problem. Um, over the country, we lost a lot of nursing home capacity through the pandemic. And hospitals are interdependent on, especially the academic medical center, which I know really well. We need our small hospitals to get patients, stabilize them, identify them. They need to come to us. We need to be there and ready for them. And when they call, we can say, yes, send them. <laughs> then we need to do our part and have a place for patients to leave. Prior to the pandemic, I think we didn't have quite enough nursing home beds then, but we often had what I've considered, we had 20 long stay patients, which was too many. And if you'd asked me to come testify five years ago, I would have been came and said 20 is too many. Last week, we had 83 patients waiting for discharge. That has a huge impact on the state of Vermont, not just the medical center. It affects every Vermonter who goes into an ER across the state who might need advanced level care. So I think the problem was smaller in the past, I think the problem's gotten bigger. And I think that um, what people need as they get older is more complex. And so more people need us now at the Academic Mental Center than we needed in the past. And our options to get people out have shrunk, which makes it harder. We've done a lot of things to try and manage more. We've opened up a floor to try and hold some of them longer, um, but that's not an ideal solution by far. So I don't have an exact answer. I've not seen exact, I mean, during COVID, we prepared to have a lot of people be very, very sick. Vermont did an amazing job in COVID, I wanna say that. And so we had some small issues, um, but a lot of other people we were delaying care for, um, which left capacity in Vermont to manage that. Thank you. Do you have a question? Yeah. All right. Yes, uh, you mentioned that because of COVID, the, the nursing homes closed, closed down. What's the status of them now? Do we have any feel for them reopening? If, if, if I know you said 20 was too much and now you have 80, if we can get some of them reopened, would that help alleviate it? And, and what's the mechanism to do that? So without any question, getting more nursing home beds online will really help. I think it's gonna take money. I think they're closed because they can't afford um, to either pay travelers, pay current wages, wages have gone up a lot. Um, and patients, even the patients that we are able to send to nursing homes are more complex than they were 10 years ago. And so the nursing homes need to have more resources. I, I do think the short-term answer is they need an investment to get more beds open. Okay. And, and are, the, are those people coming forward at all? I mean, is there any initiative? So 
I'm not. I'm sure there's people back there that can answer. <laughs> yeah. 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 And um, over the first quarter, we were able to hire an additional 80 nurses at the medical center. That We don't need travelers for that 80 spots right now. And a number of our floors are fully staffed with people that are permanent employees. So I do think it's slowly but surely. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, thank you very much for being here and seeing you. I... Um, our committee, which is the House Human Services Committee, has been hearing a lot about the homeless population and the folks who are taking care of those throughout our state. We've heard from a few different people some disturbing information that some of our hospitals are um, discharging because they don't have any more space. Homeless people that are sick, maybe not as sick enough to need to be in the hospital, but they're discharging them out onto the streets. And I wonder... I'm guessing UVM is not doing that, but when I look at these high numbers, I'm assuming that's partially why your numbers are high, but are you hearing this as well? And we really, we're trying to figure out, should we have some high end beds that are homeless, that are shelter beds, because we, we're concerned about this happening? So Burlington, UVM Medical Center, Chinna County is very fortunate that we have some opportunities for places to discharge people who don't have a home that can meet their healthcare needs. And we have Harbor Place, and we have some other local partners place where we can put patients for short time. Um, I can tell you this as an ER doctor for sure. If you send somebody out who's still sick and they don't have a mechanism to take care of their medicines or get care, they're coming back. And they're coming back to the ER, it's probably Friday night, and they're getting readmitted. So that may look like a good idea in the short term today when you have a real bind, it fails. So um, I think that we have to make sure that every Vermonter has a place to be discharged that meets their care needs at that time. And it's everything from the advanced beds that eye care is bringing online, I'm sure you've maybe heard about. Um, I'm very hopeful those med beds make some difference for those 40 long stay patients. Um, I know it will be all 40, but I think it takes some of those patients. And I think we have to have a plan for people who either does, don't have a home or the home they have doesn't meet the needs they have when they're discharged to care for them. Otherwise, they're coming back. Right, right. So follow up to that would be, are you, is UVM Health Network investing in nursing home um, you know, ways to be helpful here? Because we're all face facing this. So in Vermont, UVM Health Network has Porter, um, Helen Porter Nursing Home, has Woodridge. Um, we're doing our very best to keep all those beds open. Our nursing homes also face the same challenges as our private nursing homes across the state, staffing those beds, keeping people there. If you have to staff them with travelers, the business model doesn't really work with the current pay structure. And the other trick is that the way our nursing homes are paid, and this is a little beyond my expertise, so there's smart people back there that can do better. <laughs> I want you to hear that. Um, people who need more than just the normal it costs our nursing homes more to care for them than the revenue coming in. So we have to fix that. So they want to take more complicated patients. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I have one question. Yeah. And I was just going to say, we want to make sure that we have time for all of the witnesses. So yep. I think uh, Lori's question will be the last question. What do you have an estimate of the monthly cost to UVM health network for not getting the um, reimbursements for the people who are there? So my CMO sent me that this morning. So um, it's about $3.2 million um, over the first quarter caring for those people that's unreimbursed. Great. Thank you very much. Suzanne, and not, I might say this wrong, and I apologize, Anair. Anair, you got it. Welcome. Hi, everyone. I Let me get my video going. Good morning. Well, you can introduce yourself for the record. So I'm going to introduce myself for the record, Suzanne, um, before she does. Just I'm Helen Laban from the Vermont Healthcare Association. I'm her phone a friend. If there's any technical okay. questions, she can answer. <laughs> but other than that, it's all Suzanne. Okay. <laughs> Yes, as uh, so Laura will be my smart, or Helen will be my smart friend in the front of the room, not in the back. So thank you. Uh, again, my name is Suzanne Anair. I am a licensed nursing home administrator. I have been licensed in the state of Vermont for over 16 years. 
Um, prior to that, I was licensed in the state of Massachusetts, and I also have been licensed in the state of New York. Um, I have spent my whole career in long-term care. I started out as a college student working as a nursing assistant and provided direct care to patients. Um, and then along the way, uh, took on different leadership. So I've done a little bit of everything in the skilled nursing world and the nursing homes. Um, currently, I have uh, I was the administrator on record at CLR, which is on the SVMC campus in Bennington, Vermont, up until the fall of 2023. Uh, currently, I have transitioned into a position. I am the executive responsible for CLR. I oversee the operations and the administrator. And I'm also the vice president of business development and marketing for Allaire Health Services. Uh, in that position right now, I do spend a lot of my time working on hospital relationships, building partnerships, working on discharge uh, discharges, making sure we're having patients in the right places. So I do work with SVMC. I'm working with Geisinger, Jefferson, uh, UPMC and Penn State. So I do a lot of work in the four states that we uh, operate in. Uh, first, I want to say that, you know, I'm grateful to be here. I'm grateful. I am a Vermonter. I am grateful to have a position in Bennington and in Vermont. I, my husband and I, we raised our family here. Um, mm -hmm. We stay here in Vermont and we want to be here. So I'm passionate about what I do. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here in front of you today. You know, uh, as Dr. Leffler talked about, Workforce is one of our biggest issues. I'm only gonna to talk to you today about the issues that we face currently, um, but I do wanna put a little side note in is that there are federal, there's some federal push for us to increase the staffing mandates in the skilled nursing facilities across the country. That will affect Vermont, it'll affect every state in the country. So I just wanna put that out there. There's a real possibility. There'll be more uh, strength constraints on our organizations and our industry. Uh, currently, Right now at CLR, we have we have not rebounded from COVID. When you look at the um, tra the uh, agency staff that we use, we have not rebounded. We've actually increased in 2023, and I think we're seeing that on a lot of our facilities across the board. Um, you know, people will say, "Why haven't you rebounded?" There's a lot of reasons we haven't rebounded. So one. You know, there's a lot more opportunities for nursing staff. So for LPNs, there's a lot more opportunities. What we do in skilled nursing, it's hard work. It is very hard work. It's seven days a week. It includes holidays. We have at CLR, we have lost nurses, a lot of retirement. We've seen nurses go into medical practice positions where they can work Monday through Friday, no holidays, no weekends. We've also seen an increase in remote work for nurses. So nurses can work remotely and do clinical reimbursement insurance, workman's comp, there's a lot more opportunity and that's what we've seen at CLR. We have lost nurses who've not gone to other skilled nursing facilities. They've left skilled nursing. So that is one of the challenges that has um, we've been presented with. And I pulled some of our numbers. So in 2022, we spent roughly about $41 million in contract staff. That does not include our own staff. That is just nursing and nursing assistants to staff our facility. Um, in 2023, this number is actually low and I'll explain to you why. So in 2023, we spent $4.8 million in contracted staff. Um, during COVID, we saw about a 32% agency. Um, we were running about 32% agency per day. Um, right now we're up over 40% uh, agency staff for CLR. In 2023, and the reason I wanna talk a little bit about the, the number that I gave you, 4.8, that's actually low. Um, what we did in, in 2023, we tried to get creative. We tried to keep as much dollars at the facility rather than sending them, them to out-of-state agencies, uh, you know, paying staff that don't live in our state. We actually tried to recruit staff from Vermont and pay a little more. Um, you know, they did not reflect on what we actually can pay our staff, but we did see where we would pay staff $45 an hour just to get a six week or eight week contract from them. Um, on average, an LPN can cost anywhere between $45 and $75. Uh, a contract RN can cost anywhere from $75 to $125. And a nursing assistant can cost up to $40 to $65 per hour. Um, you know, that is significantly higher than our uh, regular staff are paid. Right now, what we're seeing at, at CLR, you know, we are right located on the SVMC campus. Um, we are seeing the highest census we have ever had. At one time, CLR was 150 licensed beds. We actually downsized to 130 beds to save money and not pay bed tax. 
Um, currently today, we opened at 122 patients. So I know we're a little bit different, some of the access that we're seeing in other facilities, um, but I do have a referral and a wait list of every day, 15 to 20 people. Um, and you know, this is something we have never seen before. Uh, will we get to 130? We, we will not get to 130. I, on average, I would say we can get to about 125 to, to really, the reason for that, why is that? We have patients who need private rooms. You know, we have Medicaid patients who may have an infectious process. We may have patients who are actively passing. We want to give them some privacy and dignity to be with their families uh, and not share a room with their roommate. So there are reasons that we can't get to 130. Um, the commissioner and the staff at Vermont, they were helpful to CLR during COVID. We had a 20 bed unit that was closed uh, due to staffing. We could not staff it. The uh, commissioner recognized that you know, having this unit, what we would do is CLR would open the unit, they would help with funding, uh, we would staff it 100% with agency, and we would only admit from Vermont hospitals, and that's what we did. You know, we met our mission. Uh, we have continued to keep that that unit open, and uh, it is 100% staffed with agency, which again is a challenge. When I talk about admitting just from Vermont hospitals, where we are in uh, Bennington. We do see a fair number of patients and referrals from our community. People from Bennington are going outside of the state for medical care. Albany Med is one that we will see a lot of referrals. We really have not, we've had a significant over 50% 50, 50 decrease in the admissions that we take um, from Albany Med. It's over that. Uh, we just can't, we are having a hard time servicing our own community. So that's one thing that we have seen change. Um, Dr. Leffler, talked about, it. Oh, one thing I do want to mention. So our center, we are 70% Medicaid. We roughly are about 20% Medicare and we're about 10% uh, private and other insurances. We did talk a little bit, Dr. Leffler brought up the acuity of patients and that has significantly changed. Again, I'm fortunate. I have the support of the hospital that is, you know, 250 yards away. Um, but the complexity of what we're seeing and the care that we need to give there's high cost medications that we aren't reimbursed for. Um, sometimes the medications we we need to give our patients, we can't get. You know, we do have pharmacies. We have specific skilled nursing for some pharmacies. Um, we have seen more at CLR Plurex catheters, which is a complexity we have never seen before. But just to treat that patient with medical supplies is over $1,000 on a patient that's $600 a day. Um, we take those patients. But when I look at some of our rural counterparts, I don't know how they would do that. Um, that would be extremely difficult with agency staff, competencies, and then cost. The other thing I see at CLR right now, what we're having, and I know this is pretty standard across the board, is uh, we are running anywhere between 10 and 15% non-payers. So we have non-payers in our facility. Um, it's not a Medicaid application issue. The, the Vermont has been wonderful about processing, processing applications. We are seeing an increase in difficulties in having the families help us fill out these applications. So we could go without payment for these patients anywhere between three, four, or five months. Um, and so you need to somehow make up that, that difference. So that's very difficult, um, especially when we're paying as much money as we are for um, agency staff. The other thing that we're seeing, I'm seeing a lot of more uh, managed products in the in the marketplace, which does delay the authorizations and getting them over to CLR. Um, the other thing we do see is there's high cost in transportation issues. So at CLR, we're fortunate. We have a bus uh, in January. We used the bus to transport, we did 185 transportations. So we did transportations back and forth to medical appointments. And we also did transportations and admissions from our hospital. I see sometimes hospitals are delayed if they don't have partners in the community that can help transport. If they don't qualify for an ambulance, you either rely on families, you have to rely on taxis, which is not safe. Hospitals do not want to put people in an Uber to send them to the nursing home. Um, so that's one thing we have been able to help with at in Bennington is uh, we have done those transportations. Um, one of the high cost items that we are not reimbursed for, and I do want to bring this up, is uh, if, if a patient comes to us and they need ambulance transportation, if they don't qualify and Medicaid or Medicare sets those rules and, and in these cases, they do not qualify for transportation. We take a patient 
they need to be transported across the parking lot for care and even a life-sustaining treatment, that will cost the facility $3,000. It's $1,500 one way. And that's also, you know, that is not reimbursed. So I do see, um, I know some of my counterparts in the state have said that is really a problem for them, especially when they look at dialysis patients. Um, it's difficult to have that transportation. Um, I know one of the things I wanted to talk about, and I know this is a start, um, and I, I wanna say thank you to the state and the, the investments that we've made. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about the reducing the occupancy, pe occupancy penalty from 90% to 80%. Um, I do think that that will help. Like certainly in my case, it will help. We're, we're over 90%. Um, the one thing I'm concerned with, I don't know if that alone will solve the workforce issues. You know, for patient or for, for facilities to, if they're at 60% and they got to get to 80% to get an, an enhanced rate and not be penalized. I'm not sure how they're going to make up that difference. There's a cost associated with that. There's a workforce issue, a cost, you know, associated with that. The workforce is going to drive some of that. So I just, I'm not sure that that alone will solve the workforce issues. The last thing I wanna talk about is the relationship with our partners, um, the hospitals we work with, the VNA. It is so important that we have the VNA with us, that we have good relationships, that they have the funding to stabilize their, their, um, their organization. We have to be able to discharge them. We can admit from the hospital as soon as we can get the patient out of the building. So. It's pretty much the same with the hospital. There's workflows, there's there's patient flows that we always need to be working on. Uh, we do spend every day at CLR. We look at bed management to make sure that people are in the right place, getting the right care and moving them appropriately. Um, I'm open to questions. Uh, I don't know, if, Helen, if I forgot anything, I would uh, hand it over to you if there's something that you wanted to bring up. That was wonderful, thank you. <laughs> Let me ask a question yeah. for it. So um, uh, thank you very much for um, helping us to understand the, the pressures that you're under. Um, just um, you were just mentioning the changes, the, the proposed changes in the occupancy rule. And um, I'm just wondering, maybe this is maybe more a question for um, the Department of Disabilities, Aging and Independent Living. But I know that it, um, you know, some facilities have reduced their license capacity um, in order to um, uh, end up with a higher occupancy rate and to also avoid paying the bed tax. Is it possible to, um, I guess, have some fluidity in that? So if a facility reduces, uh, I'll just use the example, um, if, if they have uh, 100 license uh, capacity, current capacity of 100 license beds, um, they're only able to be at 60 because of the staffing, the 60% that you were just referring to. Can they temporarily reduce their license capacity um, and then at some future time, um, you know, request to reopen their license, you know, uh, increase their license capacity? So I can, you know, based on my knowledge, so at CLR, we gave up 20 beds. Um, we cannot get those back. We won't be able to get those back. I think the, the facilities and the concern that we have in the industry, and Dr. Leffler talked about, is that facilities are choosing not to fill beds. They're still licensed. They're still paying taxes on them. They cannot staff them. Okay. And just to make sure that we're clear that the occupancy county is not based on your current occupancy, it's historic. So it's based on what your occupancy was in calendar year 2021. Yeah. And it'll be based on that for the next four years. So you would have had to have done it five years ago. Yeah, I'm just talking about like, so as, as you yeah. move forward, uh, trying to avoid the, you know, the bed tax and trying to, uh, you know, uh, avoid some of those other triggers. But uh, I think Representative Gregoire. Uh, Can and, I just, just real yeah. quick for my committee uh, or committee health care, this occupancy thing does not fall in our jurisdiction. So I know we probably are like, what are we talking about? We're going to leave it on the table for them to deal with. James. It's interesting because my question probably you guys know all about. But um, first I would say like, I mean, I understand the funding part is like, you know, Medicaid's a lot like the VA where you get a bill for $3,600 and they're like, hey, we'll give you 836 or something and have a nice day and maybe we'll pay you in 90 days or whatever. I understand that. 
But um, so well, my question is, so both the witnesses so far have talked about the higher acuity and the more complicated cases, et cetera. And I think in my head, I go, well, we're a much more modern society, advanced, et cetera. So for us that don't deal with healthcare every day, why in this modern society are cases more acute? Well, why are you having more, like more acuity, more complicated cases? Like what's the causation or is there, and that's probably a big question, but. I think I'm going to leave that to Dr. Leffler because I think that, you know, honestly, the days of us having the uh, sweet patients, easy patients who had knee replacements and hip replacements and stayed with us for, you know, 50, 40 days, those, those days are gone. Um, why our population has more complexities, I would leave that up to, you know, maybe he has more of a population health answer for that. All right, okay. we're going to turn to Dr. Leffler. Yeah, thank you. So the answer is that people are older and sicker. And we're doing more amazing things to keep them alive. And so I'm just gonna give a quick example. So we can do a procedure now uh, through your skin to replace your aortic valve. It's called the TAVR. And 10 years ago, um, if you had terrible aortic stenosis, your valve was closing and you were too sick to get the operation, you would die over six months. And then you wouldn't need to go to a nursing home. You wouldn't be costing any beds. You'd, you'd die, which is terrible. Now, 85 year old, 90 year olds come in with this problem. We can fix them that day. If they have a place to go, they go home in two or three days and they live for another three years. They're getting a nursing home stay in that three years and now they're really complicated. They have a lot going on. And that's one example I could give you 10 like that where we're keeping people alive with new amazing procedures. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Yes. Dan, and then we'll go to Sarah. Um, so over the past few years, our funding model has re relied on EFR, extraordinary financial relief. To um, What impact has that had on the ability of nursing homes to um, address the boarding in, um, problem that we have in hospitals. So I would, yeah, I think Helen should speak to that because uh, CLR has not received any, um, you know, funding except a short-term funding during COVID to open up a closed <laughs> unit. We have not received any, so I, I would leave that to Helen to answer. And that's actually a good example of, of why it hasn't. So EFR comes in when you're on the brink of closure, right? It's they're, they're, that's the extraordinary and extraordinary mm -hmm. financial relief. So even though Suzanne can tell you about all these financial problems that she's facing, she isn't at the place where she can apply yet for EFR. And so that's why we see, as you look at the charts, new facilities entering the pool, because it's not something to help you get ahead of the problems. It's just something to build a bridge once you're at risk of closure or other dramatic you know, downsizing. So it, it's simply designed to be a stopgap. It's not designed to resolve the problem. And on one hand, from a budgetary perspective, that's great, right? Because you're only giving the barest amount needed to keep facilities open. So it's very conservative in that way, but it also isn't building capacity, getting us ahead of the problem, you know, giving the money to staff up. It's not designed to do that. The only thing I would add to that, uh, to Laura's point, you know, we only have, again, 33 nursing homes and skilled facilities in the state of Vermont, and we need every single one of them. So so if we had invested that money earlier in the process, would that have the problem we have now? If we were psychic and had known that the workforce was not going to rebound in Vermont, then yes. I, you know, we really are, when you look at the national statistics on workforce, which is driving this, not only is the skilled nursing sector the slowest to recover from COVID, but Vermont is last in the pack. There was just a health affairs article on this actually in that recovery. So we would have had to have predicted that Vermont would be dead last for any sort of healthcare workforce recovery in any sector to have been able to know that that was gonna be an issue, which I was not making, I was working for the FQHCs at that time. Maybe someone, <laughs> maybe Laura knew that that was gonna happen, but it would have taken a lot of prescience. Thank you. Great. Thank you both very much. We appreciate all you're doing for Vermonters. Uh, Sarah, can you, and Jill, are you coming up too? Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jill Olson. I'm the executive director of the VNAs of Vermont. I'm just going to tee it up for a second and then just turn it over to Sarah. So um, all of you have heard from me many times, so I want you to hear from her. Um, but just to connect some dots that I'm not sure have been connected. 
So the role we play in the system is to, we, we do a tremendous number of hospital discharges. So it's probably the people who are boarding in hospitals probably aren't appropriate for home health, but almost as many individuals get discharged to skilled home health as to nursing homes. So if we weren't doing our part, that problem would be substantially worse. And if we weren't taking the pressure off of choices for care with at-home services, the nursing home beds would also be further um, impacted. So I just wanted to connect those dots for you before I introduce Sarah. Hi everyone, I'm Sarah King. I am the CEO at the VNA and Hospice of the Southwest Region. I've been with the agency for 23 years. Prior to my role as CEO, I was CFO and COO. Um, our agency has been around since 1946, starting primarily in Rutland County. And then through the early 2000s, we've actually expanded our territory down to Bennington County. And most recently, we are up in Franklin County. Um, throughout our 78 years, though, we pride ourselves on working really closely with our local hospitals, um, our nursing homes, and with our primary care physicians. I employ 325 employees at various levels um, that provide care to the residents in our communities. Currently, our census for our service area is 1,500. 577 of those patients are under what we call skilled home care. That skilled care is really what Dr. Leffler was talking about today. That's primarily where our hospital discharges the program that they come into. Um, if we did not have those patients, they would still be in a hospital bed or in a nursing home bed. The other thing that we do by taking care of the patients at home is we prevent any admissions. So this is something that we are measured on by CMS and we have worked very hard throughout the years to get that percentage of patients very low. We are below the national standard, which is about 13% and we're at 11%. So we, we are exceeding ourselves in that. Um, like all of the other VNAs in the state, and as um, Jill had mentioned, you know, we do community-based programs like Choices for Care, which really is a program to keep nursing home level patients in their home. Right now, we have about 480 of those patients on our staff. But let's go back to that skilled nursing. Um, again, this is primarily the program that we admit um, from hospital discharges, but there are some requirements with that. In order for us to be able to do that, that patient needs to need skilled nursing. They need to either need physical therapy, occupational therapy, or speech therapy. Um, and then on top of that, we do have some regulatory requirements. So if the patient that's waiting for a bed in a hospital is Medicare, and they are waiting, but they're not homebound necessarily, then we can't take them. So there's a homebound requirement on the Medicare side of business. On the Medicaid side, again, it's needing that, that, that care. What we call that is a um, skilled discipline. The other thing is um, that we need the support of the uh, primary care physician. We can't go into a patient's home without having physician orders. So if that patient's in the emergency department, we can get a referral for a one day, one visit. We can go in one time to do an assessment, but we need to have a physician be able to put eyes on this patient to give us orders, physician orders, to continue to see this patient over a period of time. So that is one of the hurdles that we are facing um, with some of our patients. We'll get a referral, we'll go in, but we don't have physician orders to go back in to see these patients. One of the other um, hurdles that we have is just like um, Suzanne was talking about and Dr. Leffler staffing. Um, we face all of those issues that Suzanne talked about. You know, we're all competing for that same pool of nurses. Um, but one of the things that I think is different about home health care is um, I've often said it's a calling. Not everyone is cut out to do home health care. You literally get this piece of paper with a referral on it, has a name, has a very brief you know, history and physical on it, might have the diagnosis, it has some of the meds, but you're going into a strange home. You are all alone. You don't know if there's a family member there that may have some mental health issues, may have some substance use issues. We go into unsafe situations every single day. Um, they don't have another set of eyes. Those patients that you've heard about the complexity, 
worth getting patients. When I started in home health, we had maybe one or two trach patients. We're double digits taking care of trach patients at. We don't want a trach patient. A trach patient is somebody that has the, they're intubated, they have yeah. to me. Yeah. Um, so we have a, a single nurse going into this home with a very complex patient. She has no one to consult with. You know, we can get a physician on the phone, but they're not there at the bedside with us. So it's it can be a very scary situation for a nurse that's not extremely confident in their skills. So they have to have a lot of confidence in their skills. They also need to remain very composed in some pretty dangerous situations. And that's a whole nother story for a whole nother day about <clears throat> the you know, situations that our staff is put into. Um, and the other point I do want to make is that it has to be a <laughs> discharge for that patient to come out of the hospital or to a nursing home to home care. So if the patient, we're only intermittent care, we're not in there eight hours a day. We're in there to provide, well, I'd like to say a couple of years ago, it was a 45 minute visit. Now we're up to patients' homes anywhere from two to three hours, depending on the complexity of that patient at home. Um, so there's really a need for a caregiver to be in the home with a lot of these complex patients. And if there's not a caregiver in the home, then it's not a safe. <laughs> um, one of the things that is also an issue for us is financial, just like the hospitals and the nursing homes, we have financial struggles just like everyone else. We rely solely, well, I should say 92% of our revenue comes from Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare is constantly cutting us and has been cutting us and will continue to make cuts to us. But we need to remain competitive with our salaries. We need to, we're all, again, we're all competing for that same pool of nurses, right? If we can't remain competitive, they're not gonna come to home care to provide that. Last year, it's getting really hard to put a budget together where we can remain competitive. My agency lost $2.3 million last year. And that was $800,000 less than the year before, only because we were fortunate enough to be able to cut some traveler costs out. Um, this is exactly the situation that happened in Franklin County and why we stepped in up there. They could not sustain a freestanding home health agency because of all of the administrative costs. So we were, we were fortunate enough to be able with, through the elimination of the Medicaid provider tax um, and through economies of scale, so, so we could cut out some of the back office and absorb those in my Rutland office, that we were able to maintain the clinical staff in Franklin County and be able to still serve the patients up there. Um, so, so just to be clear, that, that agency is in the process of closing. That's that's what's happening. And so I walked in there. Uh, it was I think it was actually one year ago today. Um, I walked into that agency and they were not going to be able to make their next payroll. Yeah. I had to get on the phone. Which agency is this? Franklin County Home Health. Yeah. I got on the phone with Jill's okay. assistance and we were able to get some contingency funding from the state that allowed us and has carried us through. Um, but that money has run out and they are now under our um, payroll. And Franklin County is a very high Medicaid payer mix. Yes. Very high Medicaid payer mix. So that's, I think it's really important to understand that the, the immediate problem for patients and staff has been solved. But it's, I think from the policy perspective to understand that high percentage of Medicaid mm -hmm. in that agency led to closure. So I'm just gonna close by saying, you know, we're all losing money. All of us home health agencies in the state are losing money. Um, and it's really not sustainable. Um, but we know we are the lowest cost option and, you know, to the healthcare system. And we want to work together with our hospitals and our nursing homes to try and keep these patients in home where they, where it's studies show they do better in their home. And so that is our goal is to keep our patients in home. A question. And then we'll go to Leslie. Um, you said you need a physician order. Right. And you're not getting them. So can you just explain that a little bit more? The shortage of primary care physicians. Okay. You're not getting it because there's no primary care provider for that person. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, what's happening in some situations is there's such a turnover of locums that their, their appointments get pushed out, pushed out, pushed out. 
but if we can't go, we cannot go in. We can't say we can wait for that physician order. We cannot go in if we do not have at least a verbal order to go. But they have to be signed in order for us to get paid. So it's it's a domino effect. And there has to be a face-to-face -face visit with the physician. I was just going to ask, yeah. can you use telehealth? You to set eyes on the face. face. You can do telehealth through for hospice, but you cannot burn them here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did you, was that your question? Well, or? my question was also about that. So what solution might you suggest to this problem? Do you, have you thought about it in a way that we can think about it? If you don't have a physician, I don't know how to fix yeah. it. There, there are some, so, so first of all, some of this problem is uh, federal. So we really need that telehealth permission for on the home health side. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, some agencies are starting to experiment with um, actually partnerships with the emergency departments. Mm -hmm. We're seeing in one place where um, the emergency departments have a really strong incentive to figure out uh, how to keep someone from needing to come to the emergency department. And yeah. so and they might be able to actually help with the order that could then allow home health to keep that patient at home. So that is one experiment that's happening, but it, I think it's much too early to say whether that's yeah. something that could work and also in our most rural settings. Yeah. Um, but that's one of the ideas that's on the table. That so where's that happening? Um, I believe that's happening at UVM Medical Center and with UVM uh, Hospice. You know, in our home health and hospice. It's a little tricky because the ER doctor can sign the first one and we do it all the time. Exactly. But then at the end of that period, you can't really stay the ER doc because they're not your primary care doc. So when they're calling and saying, we want to adjust their blood pressure medicine, like, I don't want to do that. Yeah. You need, but, I mean, you need a real primary care doctor to be managing their chronic medications. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to clarify if the plan of care, it actually has to be a physician, doesn't it? It can't be a PA or a nurse practitioner? So it, it for home care, it has to be a physician um, or a nurse practitioner acting under a physician. Okay. So if their primary... The rules are different. If their primary care is a, prim, is a um, physician assistant, that they have to see a physician. Okay. Not actually, That's not though it couldn't even be that a nurse was, practitioner. No. Yeah. It had to be a physician. Yeah. So the, the nurse practitioner could order um, a nursing home stay, but not home health which does not make any sense. Yeah. yeah. All right, one more question, Art, and then we're gonna to go to the commissioner. And this may be a question for Dr. Leffler, if, if both of you together. Are, are there people boarded in hospitals today who would like to go to their home, but can't because of your lack of work uh, workforce? Or can you accept anybody now, all that qualify? If they qualify, yeah. we are accepting them. We are not turning away. You're, you're not patients. turning away. Nope. And from your end, are there folks, I mean, do you folks, how do you, I hate to say advertise, but, but do you kind of push folks toward home if they can go? I mean, how does that dynamic work? We it it sounds stupid, but. We want everyone to go to the level of care that meets their needs. Most people want to go home. Right. <laughs> there are people want to go home. Right. In Chittenden County at the medical center, we've helped pay for travelers for home health and hospice. Okay. So we have enough travelers to take everybody because when they are short staffed, they say, well, this person could go home. Yeah. We don't have a nurse to see them tomorrow. We've actually paid their free normal rates and the rates of travelers to have enough nurses. So we want everyone to go to the level that they, the lowest level they can that meets their needs. And most people prefer home. That's the most efficient. Okay. And the cheapest, by the way. All right, so so you're kind of purging your hotel of anyone that can go home and should go home. Yes, you can. Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. I, I would also say that it is different in different parts of the state. There is more challenges transferring to home health in, in the sort of Dartmouth region than there is in the um, uh, Chittenden County okay. region. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I don't know. Thank you. I also invited a guest with me. Welcome. Hi, I'm Vegan Tierney Ward. I'm the interim commissioner at the Department of Disabilities, Aging, and Independent Living. Um, I think we have a written testimony that we shared this morning. We've been uploaded. I don't know if it will appear behind. No, it probably won't. <laughs> Unless it might 
And the reason is because what I'd like to share today is a little bit of history about what we've done so far, um, a little snapshot of data. And then Angela Smith Jang, our director of our adult services division, is going to share some information about what we're doing now, some of the projects that are happening. So with regards to the snapshot data, you heard um, this morning about beds. And I'd like to share some data that we've been tracking and really just three points of time. So January of 2022, January of 2023, and January of 2024. We had um, have been tracking the hospital post-acute information that comes from the hospitals through a database called EM Resource. And in January, we saw only about 86 people at that point in time. And now there's upwards of 140 people on any given day. So really that, that reflects what the hospitals are, are telling you this morning. Um, so that's about 65% higher over those last two years. The nursing facility bed availability back in January, 2022, we had only about 91 beds available at that point in time data. That is 76% um, occupancy. So of all available licensed beds, we were at about 76%. And at that time, we had about 15% of all beds offline. So that's a lot of beds. Um, I'm happy to say that the numbers are a little better today for nursing facilities. So we have right now about 170, mm -hmm. give or take, um, available beds. We have about roughly 83% occupancy and only about 5% based on the given day of beds offline. And when I say offline, that's really due to staffing. That's what you heard earlier about um, not officially offline, so they've not asked to reduce their beds, but they are unable to staff those beds. So even with that improvement, there are still beds that are going unused and obviously still people in hospitals unable to find the right placement for their care needs. So this, this picture that if you have it, and it is up, great, um, kind of just demonstrates those lines a bit um, on that post-acute hospital data, which is blue, and the orange line, which is the nursing um, facility bed availability. With regards to what's been done so far, so the department has um, programs that provide the Medicaid reimbursement to folks who come in through our long-term care system. So you may have heard it, Choices for Care, that's our, one of our biggest programs, and that pays across the system. So that pays for the nursing facility care, it pays for residential care, assisted living, and it also pays for home and community-based services for people who meet that criteria. So that's another key part. Folks have to meet that the federal requirements for long-term care Medicaid, and they have to meet the clinical criteria, which is a nursing home level of care to get that service. And so some of those, I call it kind of the levers that we've had over the past couple of years is how we look at rates. Um, you probably heard that we have in our 25 budget, a rate increase to address some of the nursing facility methods um, to help provide financial stability back in, 2023, we were able to do a retroactive um, inflationary rate bump for nursing facilities because at that time they were already seeing quite a bit of um, nursing contract staff, which put a huge pressure on them. In 24, um, all nursing facilities were rebased to their 21 costs. And that just means every two years, there's a rebase on that Medicaid rate to capture um, the costs in that period for that rebase. And so last year, July 1st, that was based on their 21 costs. Um, we all also did with our partners at the Department of Vermont Health Access, a rate um, review of the methodology um, in this year. We did that at the end of last year, looking at where were those pressures, meeting with our partners at the Healthcare Association to figure out where some of those biggest impacts are in the rate method. It's a complicated system. 
And if you ask me questions, a lot of questions today, I may not be able to answer them, um, but there are some really important parts of the method that needed to be changed to be able to stabilize the industry. And there's a report available for that. We also have history with um, residential care and assisted living and home and community-based services. So in 23, um, the legislature provided an 8% increase for home and community-based residential care services. We also, in 23, we negotiated a collective bargaining agreement with caregivers who self-direct. So those are those folks who may wanna go home. And if they're able to and have caregivers they can hire under a program, they can actually do that. We operate our Medicaid rates and our reimbursement through a collective bargaining agreement for that part of the program. Um, we also um, completed a rate review for residential care, assisted living, home health, non-skilled services, and adult day. And there's also a legislative report around that. And so that we were very thankful for the legislature to provide some um, well-needed increases in the 24 budget to address some of those. And the rates varied um, depending on the, the provider. It was anywhere from 4% to 79%. The 79% being in a, a rate specific to assistive community care. Those are the residential care homes that are taking folks. And that was a rate that had not been touched for years and years and years. And it was right-sided, you know, right with that 79%. So you can see we've, we've done um, work over the years with the legislature and with our partners at Department of Vermont Health Access to address some of these rates. We've also, throughout the pandemic, and even now, you heard about EFR, Extraordinary Financial Relief. Um, there's other forms of financial relief we provided um, to state uh, licensed residential care homes. They don't have the same regulatory, um, say sometimes it's a benefit, sometimes it's not, but they don't have the same structure as nursing facilities. And so they don't have a formal EFR process, but we were fortunate to use healthcare stability funds to help residential care homes. I think that um, Suzanne mentioned some grant money to help with beds. We, we also use some of those funds to help bring some beds online with um, facilities that were able and willing to do that. Um, that was to help that direct kind of flow from the hospital. And then adult days, which is another critical part of home and community-based services, has received some ongoing legislative support um, to help them through some of their occupancy challenges and their costs because those center-based services were at big risk and had to actually close for a period of time during COVID. So, um, so we continue to look at emergency financial relief in, in many ways. Um, and then more specifically with regards to this crisis, this, uh, the bed boarding challenge. Um, we've had for the last few years, I think around 2021, been partnering with the health department and their uh, Vermont Healthcare Emergency Preparedness Coalition, which brings together the partners, the folks you see in the room, the associations, and to look at where are the barriers uh, to transitioning out of hospitals. And some of the the, the projects that we've worked on, <clears throat> excuse me, have led from that work. And one of them is a new bed board. So we worked with the Health Care Association over the last couple of years to start a manually based reporting of beds. We've now moved to an online um, expansion of the Department of Mental Health's mental health bed board. So we're really excited about that. It provides access to hospitals to the information. So it is, how do they know where beds are available and what are the distinct char characteristics of the nursing homes who are taking people? Because that's mm -hmm. a, another very important part of the picture. Um, we've also worked with our partners at DIVA, uh, Vermont Health Access to um, look at the Medicaid eligibility process. So where are there opportunities for um, just improving the process, frankly, for long-term care Medicaid, which is very heavily federally uh, mandated. And <clears throat> that's always a barrier when someone applies for that Medicaid. 
yes, but when there's more languages on the program yeah so uh, we're looking at trying to dig into that a bit more and then in 2023 um, with the help of the health department were um, a, a series of just root cause analysis this was just work to um, engage with hospitals to hear and listen about what were those barriers and and we have some information that is leading to a playbook that will be uh, shared with hospitals and care managers who will be able to look at where do they go when there's a need for complex help with complex placements and with turnover that that playbook will be useful and then you've heard about <coughs> excuse me the specialized care in a nursing facility this came out of um, not only that group, but also um, a healthcare reform group that really was interested in starting and helping to find a place where folks with these complex combination of nursing home level of care, so they need medical, physical care, and also have things like mental health conditions, substance use disorders, or they're in jail. That's a whole nother population and discussion, but. How do we do that? And and Oh, there's oh. quite a bit more here. <laughs> so if there's any one or two key things we need to know. Yes. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I would say I support um, everything that's in our budget with regards to the nursing facility rate method and how to stabilize that. I also support our partners who testified about home and community-based services as well and how do we shore that up. And I'd like Angela just to maybe tag on a couple of things that we're doing that you'd <coughs> want to know about. Um, yeah, I'm, how do I pull out just those key, those, just those key points? Angela Smith-Jang, Director of Adult Services, for the record. Um, we are, have a team of, of nurses that are working with the hospitals on some of those complex care discharges. I really want to um, ensure that that gets called out. <coughs> Um, and they, they work to build relationships with the hospitals, the nursing homes, the other providers, and kind of work on it as a team to find the right placement for folks. Um, we're able to offer special rates um, at, in certain situations on an individualized basis for someone who has complex care to support a nursing home in taking them. Um, and then we're doing some pilot work. We have um, some grants with hospitals um, to uh, to pilot enhanced discharge planning, really looking at um, really looking at uh, supporting that process. We're working with um, the two hospitals in Southern Vermont, Brattleboro and Southwest. And then I'm excited to say too that we're using some en enhanced FMAP funding, the ARPA funding, to do a promotional campaign around our direct care workforce as well. Um, Really, we know workforce is um, a, a key, the key challenge that is being faced across the continuum of care. And so this, this um, marketing campaign will, will promote the value of this work and support connecting workers to yeah, all of our providers across the continuum. So that'll be happening this year as well. Right. And, and I do want to um, call out the eye care uh, hospital or facility. I'm not sure what it's called not in our committee, but um, I know that's a long time coming, which is fantastic. Based on everything we've heard here, I'm curious how many hospital patients I care will take. That's a great question. Um, we've been working with our Department of Mental Health and our Department of Corrections to track people who might be eligible for, for their services. And I would say 
that people who are, it's going to depend because people have to be fully eligible for choices of care. There's that piece. They also have to be able to be served in a nursing home, uh, kind of eligible to live in a nursing home. Um, so it will depend on the actual individual people. So they're looking at that now. They're looking at our list of people that we know about, trying to look at who would be eligible, who would be a pri the highest priority because the beds will be a premium when they first open up. Um, we think there might be about 20 folks from um, corrections that eventually could be served. So they'll have to balance that between probably, I'm estimating about half of those beds for hospitals and half or maybe a little less than half for folks in corrections. And so when you say they, who makes that determination? Mm -hmm. The determination is made between the state and eye care. So there's a process that each person has to go through to be screened because we have to make sure that this is the least restrictive setting for people when they apply because it's going to be the highest level of care for folks. So the state will screen for that, screen for eligibility, and then eye care will do their required admissions screening as well. Great. I apologize, we've run out of time, but we appreciate all the work from everyone that's in the room today. We know it's a tough situation and we thank you. Um, and everyone who's online, Suzanne, thank you for being, for being here. And uh, healthcare is uh, back in the room for a 10-15 start.